St. Louis, gateway to the west, and the huge gateway arch made of stainless steel and towering 630 feet high symbolizes the city's important role in American history. Another great structure in St. Louis's new Civic Center development is Bush Memorial Stadium, scene of baseball's 37th annual All-Star Game. The Midsummer Dream Game was inaugurated in 1933. First, the American League dominated the competition, but in recent years, the pendulum has swung to the National League, which now leads in victories 18 to 17. Bobby Knopf, the Angels star second baseman, takes some practice swings. Stan Musial and Ted Williams, the greatest hitters of their time, who were rivals in many of these star-spangled contests, get together behind the batting cage. Dick McAuliffe, Detroit slugging shortstop, already has grabbed a bat. Hank Bauer, whose Orioles are far in front of the American League, is a coach in today's game. Bauer's key men are the Robinson boys. Here's Frank, the slugging outfielder. The other is Brooks Robinson, fine clutch hitter and brilliant third baseman. Ted Williams and Casey Stengel, newly elected Hall of Famers, are honorary coaches. Pittsburgh's strong-armed Roberto Clemente shows how he throws. Carl Yastrzemski of Boston, 1963 batting champion, warms up. Al Kaline, Detroit's veteran star who has a 306 lifetime average, mops the perspiration off his face. Hank Aaron of the Atlanta Braves leads the majors with 26 homers. Tony Oliva, a two-time batting champion, talks it over with Cleveland's Rocky Calavito. And here is Leo Cardenas, star Cincinnati shortstop, unlimbering his arm. Ron Sato of the Cubs, still recovering from a fractured cheekbone, nevertheless will play in today's game. Willie McCovey, San Francisco's big bomber, is as loose as ever. Earl Batty talks with the American League bat boy. Willie Mays of the Giants, a standout in all-star competition, has the most hits, most runs, and most stolen bases. Stan Musial and Ted Williams who is talking with Willie and Herman Franks, hold most of the remaining all-star records. President Joe Cronin of the American League and Warren Giles, the National League president, chat with Casey Stengel. The band swings smartly onto the field for the pregame ceremonies. The players of the all-star squads take the field and line up on the first and third base foul lines. The players and the fans come to attention for the traditional playing of the Star Spangled Banner. Commissioner William Eckert supervises his first All-Star game. The rival managers, Sam Mealy and Walter Alston, meet with the umpires. Mealy and Alston shake hands with Vice President Hubert Humphrey. The Vice President then tosses out the first ball, a perfect pitch to Joe Torrey. Nearly 50,000 are packed into this beautiful new stadium, built at a cost of more than $26 million. And there go the National Leaguers to start the ball game. Plate umpire Al Bardic awaits the action. Sandy Koufax, the peerless Dodger lefty, takes his warm-up tosses as the National League starter. Dick McAuliffe steps to the plate, and the game is on. McAuliffe swings at Sandy's first pitch and fouls to Santo. The next two also are retired, and the American League takes the field. Denny McLean, young Detroit star, is the American League starter. Leading off is Willie Mays, new National League home run champion with 525. With 10 more, he'll pass Jimmy Fox for second place on the all-time homer list. But it's no homer this time. Willie takes a third strike. With two outs, Hank Aaron is the next batter. McLean, in dazzling form, also places a third strike past Aaron for the third out. Koufax mops his brow in the second inning. The blistering heat has sent the temperature soaring over 100 degrees. With one out, Brooks Robinson is the hitter. Robinson smashes the ball into left field. Aaron comes rushing in and attempts a shoestring catch, but he misses. 
Hank falls and scrambles back to his feet to pursue the ball. Meanwhile, Robbie continues around the bases and pulls up at third with a triple. With Koufax obviously in a jam, catcher Joe Torre goes to the mound to talk over the situation. After retiring George Scott, Koufax seems out of trouble, but with Bill Freehan at the plate, Sandy unleashes a wild pitch. Robinson scores, and the American League leads one to nothing. In the National League second inning, McLean retires the fourth man in a row, and then faces Ron Santo. The Cubs slugger rips a line drive toward the foul line, but Brooks Robinson is there. Mr. Impossible grabs it for a dazzling play. Sandy Koufax closes his three innings on a yield of only one hit and one run. Kurt Flood bats for Koufax in the National League third. McLean pitches, and Kurt Karam's a bouncer off Denny's leg to Tanak, who throws him out. And that completes three perfect innings for the sensational Tiger Hurler. Jim Bunning of the Phillies is the National League pitcher in the fourth. He thereby sets a new record with eight appearances in all-star play, the first five as an American leaguer with Detroit. Jim pitched a regular season perfect game two years ago. Jim Cott, the big Minnesota lefty, takes over the American League pitching in the fourth. Mays leads off with a single to left for the first National League hit. For Willie, who holds the record, it's his 22nd All-Star hit. Roberto Clemente is the next hitter. The star pirate outfielder smashes a single to center, and K-Line's quick fielding forces Mays to hold up at second. The National League has now started its first scoring threat. But Cott manages to get two out before Santo steps into the batter's box. Mays is on third now with the potential tying run. Santo's mighty swing produces a dribbler Robinson cannot come up with. It's a hit, and Mays races home from third. And the game is now tied at one and one. Manager Alston makes lineup changes for the sixth inning. Juan Marichal is the new pitcher, and Ron Hunt of the Mets is at second base. Harmon Killebrew, Minnesota's powerful home run slugger, pinch hits for Jim Cott. Marichal cuts loose with his high kicking delivery, and the killer cracks the ball just out of Leo Cottonus's reach for a single to center. With one out, Al Kaline comes to the plate. And the veteran Detroit star comes through with a line shot for another single that puts Killebrew on second with one out. Jim Fregosi runs for Killebrew, but Marischal checks the rally. Mel Stottlemyer of the Yankees pitches the bottom of the sixth. Umpire Jim Honachick signals lineup changes to the announcer with Earl Batty going behind the plate and Fregosi to shortstop. Stottlemyre takes the side with Clemente on second base following his two base hit with one away. The Yankees sinker baller delivers and Hank Aaron slashes the ball to Brooks Robinson. The Baltimore fielding marble once again makes a fine play to throw out hammering Hank. The score remains tied at one all at the end of the sixth inning. The message board proudly announces it's the biggest sports crowd in St. Louis history. The Cardinals Tim McCarver goes behind the plate in the eighth. Maury Wills, the Dodger shortstop, enters the game at the same time. The score remains tied in the eighth as Sonny Siebert, Cleveland's no-hit pitcher, takes over for the American League. Jim Hart leads off the inning for the National League. The Giants star third sacker looks at a third strike as Siebert breezes through the inning to maintain the tie score. With the game still tied at one and one, Gaylord Perry of the Giants comes in to pitch for the National League in the ninth. At this midseason point, he has the best winning percentage in the majors with a 12 and one record. Kaline is the batter. Perry goes into his windup 
and Kaline pokes a slow bounding grounder toward the shortstop hole. But Ron Saddle comes across to grab the ball, juggles it momentarily, and then recovers quickly to throw him out. Now with one out, Frank Robinson is the next hitter for the American League. Robbie gets under a carry pitch and lifts a pop fly in the short left field. Wills dashes back and makes a beautiful over-the-shoulder catch. That sweltered a possible American League threat. In the National League ninth, there are two out with Sato at bat. Tommy Agee, the star White Sox rookie, is in center field. Siebert winds up, delivers, and Sato rips a smash over third. But Brooks Robinson is there again. He makes a miraculous stop. He uses both hands to clutch the ball and then throws Sato out. Still tied at one to one, the thriller goes into the tenth for the fourth extra inning battle in all-star history. Gaylord Perry, still pitching for the National League, first faces Brooks Robinson. Brooks swings at an inside pitch, hits it on the handle, and bloops one just over Maury Wills' head for a single. That brings up Detroit slugging Norm Cash. Perry unleashes a high fastball that sails away from McCarver for a wild pitch, and Brooks Robinson goes to second base. Perry retires Cash, but he's still having trouble recovering his control. He can't get that ball over, and Earl Batty walks. Alston goes out to talk with Perry while McCarver and Santo listen in. With only one out, it's a tough spot for the National League. Bobby Richardson of the Yankees is up next. Bobby lifts a pop foul behind first base, and McCovey reaches into the field boxes for a sensational one-handed catch. That's two out. But Perry now faces Jim Fregosi. The Angels shortstop takes a mighty swing, but fans, and that ends the American League threat. Washington's Pete Rickard comes into pitch, and Tim McCarver gets ready to lead off for the National League in the bottom of the 10th. McCarver picks on the first pitch and singles to right. Ron Hunt gives a signal from the batter's box. Norm Cash edges in. Hunt lays down a butt toward first. Rickard moves in quickly to field the ball. He looks at second base but decides he doesn't have time for a force out. Instead, he makes the sure play at first base. McCarver is now in scoring position as Maury Wills approaches the plate while swinging a bat to loosen up. Pete Rickard checks the runner at second base, then fires and Wills slashes a line single into right center field. Here comes McCarver around third. He scores and the National League wins two to one. Coach Harry Walker, who waved McCarver in, leaves the swarm of National Leaguers, Alston, Perry, Mays, and all the rest, congratulating McCarver and Wills, the final heroes of the day. Biggest winners of all, however, were the fans. It was a real thriller, worthy of the all-star label. So throw all your pictures away. We're gonna cheer.